Joining us now is Patrick Brown, co-director of the climate and energy team at the Breakthrough Institute. Patrick, you guys work on a lot of technological solutions to these uh, climate challenges, but I don't know if there was an answer here in Hawaii. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that we look at is uh, using AI to try to better predict uh, wildfire danger. And so we think that that's something that, that could help that, you know, if you uh, can know ahead of time uh, where the danger is going to be, that you could potentially, you know, shut off power lines uh, and do these types of mitigation efforts that could reduce ignitions, at least uh, in this case. And so that's something we're looking at in California, but uh, maybe something that's uh, taken on board more in Hawaii as well. Sure. I mean, California, areas that are prone to them, you can absolutely imagine how being able you know, to use AI or any kind of technology to get ahead of the problem would be helpful. This, these wildfires, though, seem to come out of nowhere. Well, uh, you know, the, the more that we build in uh, areas that uh, are increasingly prone to wildfires, which is more of the land surface over the globe, because as it gets warmer, most of the land surface be tends to get drier. Uh, and so that means that you're going to have more people uh, in harm's way of wildfires uh, when they do occur. And in this case, in, in Hawaii, uh, there's also this issue of non-native uh, fire-prone grasses and shrubs that are that are in that region that are very quickly dried out when we had this uh, heat wave and lack of precipitation in that area over the recent uh, weeks and months. And so that made it so it was a situation where once the fire started, uh, probably human caused, of course, uh, that it was very difficult to contain. And uh, it was a bad situation with uh, very large uh, trade winds uh, associated with uh, Hurricane Dora. And right. so all these factors came together to, to produce a, you know incredibly devastating situation. Do we know what the origin of this fire or these fires was? I don't believe we do at this point. But most fires are caused by human um, error of one sort or another, correct? That's right. That's right. And so that can be good news, right? Because that means that we have control over that. Uh, and so efforts to reduce human ignitions, uh, either just through, you know, awareness of uh, reducing accidental ignitions uh, from, you know, things as simple as, as putting out campfires, that type of thing, uh, that can actually have a real impact on on total wildfires. So so if you if I were to ask you where where does climate change fit in the causation of this fire or the severity of these fires, where would you place it? In other words, was it a contributing factor? Was it responsible for? Um, talk me through that. Yeah, so I guess I would zoom out a little bit and not focus specifically on this fire because uh, various factors can can counteract uh, climate change. Uh, in specific regions. But I study the, the U.S. West in general, where we've seen this large increase in uh, area burned over the past several decades. And climate is definitely a contributing factor to that. Uh, you know, we, we call the shorthand fire weather, um, we, we say is hot, dry, and windy. And uh, climate change, so increasing greenhouse gas concentrations, increase the temperature. So that's the hot part. Uh, and they actually tend to, hot and dry kind of go together in the U.S. West. So as it gets hotter, the land surface uh, gets drier. And so it dries out vegetation um, and makes fuels uh, burn uh, more easily. So we don't see a windy component uh, change really from climate change. Uh, that's a pretty weak signal if, if it exists at all. But we do see as it gets warmer, it gets uh, drier. And so that is the that's the pathway by which increased greenhouse gas concentrations increases fire proclivity. Um, but the other major factor is uh, this ill-advised uh, policies that we've had since uh, the early 20th century to immediately put out all fires. Uh, and so what that has done is it's caused there to be a large uh, increase in in vegetation, an unnatural uh, amount of vegetation in, in a lot of our forests in the U.S. West and grass and shrublands. Uh, and so that means that we now have a drier situation with a lot more fuels than would be there naturally. And so then when a fire does occur, it's much more severe and much more difficult to fight than it would have been otherwise. That is fascinating mm -hmm. and counterintuitive. I never would have thought about that, Patrick. Real quickly, um, just because we're heading in, on a different sort of weather climate topic, we're hearing predictions that hurricane season, you know, how good are these predictions? Um, and are the same inputs that you described, heat and so forth, uh, telling us to expect an uptick in activity over time or no? Yeah, they're pretty rough. It's uh, it's pretty hard to uh, predict uh, most weather and climate phenomena at this seasonal timescale, you know, months out in advance. 
Uh, the National Hurricane Center says 60% chance that will be above average. So you can just kind of tell by the wording there that that's not a super precise uh, forecast. So that's above average in terms of the number of, of major hurricanes. Um, so basically it, it is a lot warmer this year because we have, a, we have an El Nino situation and there's some countervailing factors with El Nino that can sometimes suppress hurricane activity in okay. the Atlantic. Uh, but overall, as it, as it gets warmer, you tend to see an, a, a small signal in the up, uptick in the, in the most, uh, most intense hurricanes. True. But it's a, it, it could easily go the other way. Well, uh, thinking about it in light of, you know, safety, human aspect, and also spiking oil prices with inventories where they are. So always curious about the verity of these predictions. Patrick, thanks for your time today. We appreciate it.